Do do boop. If the low brass is playing an A exact and my violin is tuned perfectly, my A will vibrate without me doing anything. Like the string vibrates. You can see it happen. So this, you know, when everything is perfectly in tune and the instruments are perfectly together, there's an extra vibration you're actually a part of. And that just makes the the emotion that much stronger. Um it's totally incredible artist the right brain and then the engineer the left brain right? this idea that you can build service discovery or a service mesh that will be reliable and that could you know if you deployed in google cloud and azure and and amazon and your amazon instance goes down and you want to put up a backup you know in a different region or in a different cloud and you just can i mean it's the technical it is a challenging engineering problem. Jessica, first of all, I would like to thank you. I've been really waiting to have a, a discussion with you about uh, the company you are trying to build next and the company you're working with right now. And apart from that, I would say uh, your background as a professional violin and viola player and teacher. I, I would say personally, it's very fascinating. And I was very surprised to learn that that's where you, you know, uh, got started with. And eventually right now, uh, you're working with Harshikot, which is one of my very favorite companies. Uh, just a personal note, I think they are the smartest company on the planet. That's what I think. But we'd also, you know, would like to uh, learn from you. How has your experience been? And overall, I, I hope, you know, we both can have some fun together. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds great. To get started with, right, would, would you like to talk about the startup you are working on right now? And then, you know, later on, we can maybe go back to where the idea came from. Um, so currently, uh, I'm working on a startup called Unlighten, and really the goal is to create communities that are specific for teachers. Um, I was a public school teacher, and so much of my time was spent with my students in the classroom, which is where the work needs to happen. And at the end of the day, all of my coworkers and I were exhausted, and we would be with students after and then we would go home um, after the school day and then we have grading and lesson planning and so no real opportunity to talk with each other about what was happening so uh, my goal is to help build communities inside of schools that are private to the school and available online so that way that teachers have a sort of virtual um, staff lounge where they can have all these discussions that they just don't have time to have, but also to make that community accessible to uh, other schools and other communities. So that way that teachers can work with teachers from other schools, administrators can work with administrators from other schools and create learning communities in education that are available and accessible. And, and, and could, could you also share like, you know, your experience with being a teacher? for I think the earlier part of her career? I started teaching when I, violin when I was 19 and it's how I put myself through college. So I taught, uh, I taught probably 20 or 25 hours a week every day after my classes. I taught children to play violin and, and it really made me realize that I love teaching and I still love teaching. So um, when I graduated, I started teaching in a small school in Vermont. I started, I taught band, I taught orchestra, I taught marching band, which was really very interesting because it's just not my, the thing that I do. Um, but I did it. And then, um, and then I moved to New York city to do my graduate school education and taught in a large, large public school there. And I taught orchestra and band music production and chorus and um, music history. I, I started the drumline program there. So really just um, a, a lot of fun to, to do and to teach. Um, and I still, even though I don't teach now as my main um, 
career, I still um, teach Python to kids. I teach intro classes. Um, I teach software testing classes and workshops from time to time. Um, teaching is a really big part of who I am and what I like to do. And, and, and so when you say that you, know, you started teaching violin at the age of 19, so when did you start learning it? And how did you like first got introduced to the idea of learning it? Um, so I started, I learned about the violin when I was eight years old. Um, our school had a program. My parents didn't have any money for music lessons or anything. Um, they knew I liked to sing, but that was kind of really it. Um, and so our school said, oh, well, you can play the violin. And uh, it, when you're nine, when you, when you enter in the U.S., it's the fourth grade. And I just, I really wanted to do it. Like, I didn't know why. I hadn't picked one up before. Um, and I was so small as a nine-year-old that they actually, my grandparents had to get a special violin for me the first year because I was too small for all of the school violins. Oh, like, like a small um, one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like a very yeah, yeah. small one. Um, so I started, um, you know, it was funny because I brought the violin home. I got, I got the special violin. I brought it home and I really wanted to play it badly. And, um, you know, and the teacher had said, don't take, you know, don't take it out. Don't use the bow. Don't do it. And my mother, a little bit of a rebel, she says, well, why not? And, so, <laughs> you know, and so I did take it out and I did start to play with it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just, I, my parents didn't have money for private lessons at all. So I didn't, I studied at school and played in school orchestra, but then every day at home, I practiced. I loved practicing. Um, I was really not good at the, in the beginning. No child really, you know, starts out sounding very good. And so my mother used to make me practice outside like quite a lot, um, because she was just like, no, this is, you, you go out. Um, but I loved it. And I mean, I haven't stopped loving it since. How, how did you understand that, you know, I can actually start teaching violin because that's pretty entrepreneurial of you at a very young age. Uh, like yeah. Do, so I had pick up a job. You could do so many other things to make money, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my violin teacher in college, the first um, private lesson teacher that I had um, was my teacher my first year of college. And I went to a school called Plattsburgh State, and that was in Plattsburgh, New York, very uh, small state college. They didn't at that time have a music major program, but I still took all of the extra music classes. And so one of these classes was my violin lessons. And she saw that I liked teaching in general. So when she would get um, calls for very beginner students, she would give those students to me. And she actually taught me about how how to teach and the basics that I needed to teach them. Um, and because I was really, you know, when I I was really having to rethink my own basics because I spent my whole life without um, private lessons and private instruction. So I was thinking about doing my own, and I was also thinking about okay, and how do I explain this to a six year old? Um, and so both of those things kind of happened at the same time. Um, and teaching violin at the time paid a lot better than a job in a, you know, uh, in a job in a, in a grocery store or in a restaurant. Um, I mean, I did have those types of jobs too. Uh, you know, I, I did work in a restaurant as a waitress, but, um, my violin teaching paid a lot more. So whenever I was able to, to do that, I chose that first. So, so you know, uh, you say you are a self-taught violin. Uh, you you learned it on your own, and I I started to learn violin like in, during the pandemic, us, using this app called Trala. I'm not sure if you're aware about it. It's a Chicago-based company, and uh, it's it's a very guided way of you know learning the violin, and I still struggle with it. So, so when a nine-year-old gets access to a violin and starts practicing you know, on her own. How do you think you kind of figured out your way around it since there were, there were no private classes? For it? Yeah. Um, so I had, we had a school orchestra. And so every week I would go to the orchestra class and the teacher would give all of us a group lesson and teach us 
you know, she would give little tips and tricks. So I think that helped because I really paid attention. I was very interested. So, um, you know, I tried very hard to do everything the way that she said, which I, which I think helped me, um, to, to just get her feedback. Um, and then, you know, I think part of it, a, a lot of playing any musical instrument is, um, focusing on the sound that you're getting and technique helps us get to the outcome which is sound so the better your technique is the more relaxed you are the better your you know your hand frame for your left hand the better your bow hand for your right hand of course the more easily that tone and sound comes um and as a young child i wanted to make music so getting to the the outcome was probably i was just so focused on that everything else that i did like if it didn't sound quite right i was like okay why doesn't it sound right what can i fix um and then the older i got you know i had classmates who were older i had classmates who did have private lessons and so we would play together during orchestra they would play i would watch them um so, so i think you know it was just taking in everything that I could around me and, and, you you know, um, talking with people, listening to people who did play, who were in school with me, watching how they played, um, watching violinists on, on, you know, on sometimes on television, if they're, you know, my parents would say, Oh, there's a violinist on television. You have to come watch this. Um, and so, so I think all of those things, but mostly wanting to make music, that I liked to play, you know, playing songs that I knew that I liked, um, really helped me to focus on the joy of it and the outcome of it. And I adjusted a lot of my technique to that. Did I do it all correctly? Absolutely not. Uh, (laughs) You know, I spent a lot of time in college redoing a lot of technique or just learning it the first time how to properly do something. Um, and I'm still, um, I don't regret that time that I didn't really learn things exactly properly because what I did learn was to love the instrument and to be really persistent about the outcome, getting the outcome that I want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, you also, I, I think, play with orchestras. Yes. Mm-hmm. So you start teaching the violin and so you're doing that. So how, how, how does the orchestra thing come along? Well, so, you know, when you're in college as a music student, you are required to play chamber music and orchestral music. So you're required and you're required to play solos. So you have to do all of these things, which I'd never done, um, except for in school. But at the college level, it's definitely different. So that's when I, at the college level, when I really started to understand um, how powerful a full orchestra is how beautiful it sounds to sit inside of a sound i mean if you imagine your favorite symphony or your favorite you know band or anything and you imagine that you hear it on great speakers then imagine being in the speakers the vibration of the drums the brass sitting all i mean it's a whole different experience so once I had that experience of sitting inside of a full orchestra, I, I was totally hooked on, on doing this. And so even though I didn't have to play in orchestras anymore after I graduated, I actually went back to the college orchestra director and said, hey, how do I, like, can I keep playing? And he said, you can, but you have to play viola. And I was like, but I don't have a viola. I don't really know how to play viola and I don't know how to read alto clef. <laughs> I was like, I don't know how this is supposed to work. And he says to me, well, we have a viola and it's basically like the violin. So you'll, and the clef you'll figure out. And I was just like, are we serious right now? And he was very serious. And that's actually, you know, so I ended up after college, the first thing I did was pick up viola back in the same orchestra and just kind of learned viola at that point um but it was my way to keep playing as an adult it was to to be in orchestras um and and to 
and to really experience not only the, the beauty of just the sound, but also the community of other people who are playing, who want to be playing. Um, so it's a really great, it's just a, it's just a great experience that I've always, I've always loved. Could, could you, could you share, you know, uh, a little bit as to how these orchestras are organized or like built? Sure. Um, so, so there's, I mean, there's lots of different kinds of orchestras, right? We all know the big orchestras, the Berlin Philharmonic, the New York Philharmonic, the Cleveland Orchestra, the London Symphony, like we know the big, big orchestras. Um, and those orchestras are really, they're, they're, uh, highly competitive with, um, with players from the top, top schools and who've, who've been playing with private lessons since they were three years old. Um, these, and these orchestras are a full-time job. So they hire, you know, when, when you audition for that orchestra, it's a very serious audition. Um, they hire people as if it's, it's like, they're like the Hashi Corp of orchestras or the Amazon or the Google of orchestras. They are hiring full-time musicians. Those musicians practice five or six hours a day. They're in rehearsals every day. They have, you know, hundreds of rehearsals and many concerts and concert appearances a year. So that's how those orchestras operate. Those are like the top professional orchestras. Then you have in many places, regional orchestras. So my, um, my county in New York, the, the, I live in Orange County and there's a uh, Dutchess County, also and so there are three orchestras here that i play with and they're also professional in that they they pay money but they're more like a part-time job because they pay you for the rehearsals and for the concert so that's kind of how it's organized and then what that means though is that you actually have a lot less rehearsals so for every concert that i do i probably play two concerts a month i have a, an orchestra week where it's three rehearsals and then the concert. Um, and so, so it's quite intense because I get the music, I have to practice, work out all the difficult parts. Then you go to the orchestra with everybody else who's there. And it's a lot like coworkers, but instead of talking, you know, I have my section and it's the six other violinists who play the same part. We play the same part together. And then we have the, we have the viola section and they play a different part. And then we have all the brass instruments. So all of these different parts playing together, but we have to listen. And the conductor has their vision that they shape. Uh, you know, they say, oh, well, I want to play Beethoven this way with power and a lot of uh, lyricism. So that means that you guys have to do a longer bow here and play this part at the frog. And they have all kinds of instructions to help us understand and execute their vision for the music, right? Which is, um, which is a big part of the work of the rehearsals is understanding the conductor's vision and then using my technical skill, all of us using our technical skill to make his vision or her vision a reality. You know, I have always had this question. First of all, could, could you share a little bit about the, the kind of music orchestras plays? I, I would say I listen to this genre of music a lot, which is, I think it's, it's pronounced Baroque. Baroque? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes. Baroque. Mm -hmm. Yes. And according to Spotify, uh, it's my number one genre since the last two, three years now. And I did not know this, but Baroque is like a time period when a lot of things happen and not just music. Yes. Right. Like, you know, there is Baroque architecture, there is Baroque fashion, there is Baroque music. So. I have always been fascinated about the genre, like want, wanting to know more about uh, the genre from an orchestra or a musician's perspective who are in it, which is which I think we can discuss. And also, uh, do, do these orchestras, you know, compose original music as well when, when they are performing in front of an audience? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so starting with, we'll start with the Baroque question. Um, so. I mean, yeah. So as you've as you've figured out, Baroque is a, a stylistic period in orchestral music. So I mean, I I would say that um, that Bach is probably the most prolific 
Baroque composer we know, Vivaldi. Um, so things like the Four Seasons. Um, for for any violinist, box sonatas and partitas, the unaccompanied sonatas and partitas. Anybody who loves organ music no, has probably heard Bach organ music. Um, so yeah. the the thing about the Baroque, whether it's Baroque architecture or art or orchestral music or solo music, is you you will probably notice detail. It never, never, never stops. Um, as when I'm playing Baroque music, it's just like it is. It's constant. I'm constantly uh, moving, playing the Vivaldi Four Seasons, whether it's the solo part or with the orchestra. You're just going and going and going, um, and every instrument is always moving. And um, there's the counterpoint. So it, the instruments move both with and against each other harmonically to create tension, but then bring it back together for, uh, for closure, right? So, um, and I think that's something that you kind of see in Baroque art and architecture too. It's very ornate, it's very detailed, it's very- Pretty intricate. Yes, yes, yes. And, um, you know, so I think that's, um, you know, that's something when you're playing Baroque music in particular, um, it's, it's actually, can, it can be quite hard because, it's exhausting just because you never stop, you never have a rest. Um, but it's also really, um, you know, studying Bach. I've, I've studied the same Bach partita and really invested time in it for probably almost 20 years now. Um, just trying to pick up details and learn different ways of phrasing and um, how to make a single line have multiple the feel of multiple voices of which for the solo works is you that's the point but it's also really hard um and i think with broke orchestras it's listening knowing like sure i i i play all the time when am i important and when am i not important when is something else important when is another instrument important in order to make the whole picture come alive so from from that perspective, I think that that's kind of um, it's an interesting thing about playing Baroque music and just understanding um, th the way that harmony and and um, and melody and really um, the experience of the Baroque comes through in, in an orchestral setting. Um, in terms of orchestras kind of recording and playing you know there are different kinds of orchestras like like i said there's um you know like the professional the the big big orchestras they all of course they go in studios they do live recordings they have all the resources to do this um one of the orchestras i play with in in new york the park avenue chamber symphony they do recordings of their work and i'm actually um i played with them on and off since 2009 so i there are recordings that i've done with them that are on spotify um and and it's fun but also terrifying um just because you know you're like oh god like the mistake right like you don't want to make your mistake in that moment you know um and then uh some of the regional orchestras uh, one of them i have a recording session coming up with in march um and so, you know, so there's these, sometimes it's recording in a studio, sometimes it's hiring the sound crew to come and set up in a particular location. Um, it really depends on what, what they're trying to do, uh, like the purpose of the recording. Um, and so, so, but yeah, it's something that, that we, we do. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and it's definitely nerve wracking, but not as bad as, not as nervous for me as like a solo recording. So, you, you know, you mentioned Bach, but I have been like, you know, uh, seeking out uh, diff another, other composers, I would say. Like, you know, uh, the kinds of, the, like, for example, Robert Schumann, Claude Debussy, Richard Wagner. Mm, yeah. I'm just a, cons I'm just a listener. I don't understand the technicality of it, but I, I would say they... For me personally, they demand your attention. And once you kind of give it to them, they take you with them. And they, they kind of just play with it in a very, you know, playful way. And they'll make you sad and they'll make you excited and they'll make you happy. 
and if you are paying attention right you kind of understand that you know you have surrendered and that you cannot do anything about it and i think that that's the best part though of like i mean without listeners what is an orchestra first of all you know so i always whenever somebody says oh i'm just a listener it's like you're the reason the orchestra exists the listener is the reason that a musician exists without listeners a musician is very lonely at home playing music and that's nice and the joy of vegan and orchestra is is hearing the audience gasp or or hearing just total silence even from small children because they're so taken in which is it's it's really strange especially in today's world you know because an orchestra is one of the few places that people say put away your phone um so it's like okay um that's that's an interesting fact that this is something that happens and that people still do it and choose to do it um that's the reason the composers you mentioned are um a lot of romantic composers which makes a lot of sense when you talk about the emotional journey because that's sort of the the i mean that's kind of considered one of the key aspects of romantic music is the change in emotions yes and the stretching of sound and time and stopping resting um the violins finally get a break right it's like time for the woodwinds to play we're very happy about this <laughs> um but yeah that doesn't surprise me at all that you um that you have this um experience with it and and yeah i mean it makes actually romantic composers some of my favorite it's quite religious yeah the experience is very religious i would say yeah there's definitely one can go to a higher plane in that way yeah yeah so you know when you mentioned that uh, when you're playing in an orchestra the the experience is that you are inside of the speaker right so how was could, could you describe that emotion because that's our audience is in front right but when you're inside of it how would that be like i mean the the first time i really really experienced it was when i was playing holst's planets in my college orchestra and i was sitting in the viola section and it, it's this one jupiter is my favorite movement from the planets it's my favorite favorite movement i love this so much i could be paid to play this all the time and never be sad i cry every time i play it like i always have as as a player um and as a viola you sit by the timpani and by the low brass so there's really a ton of actual physical vibration and so i'm sitting in the middle of jupiter in the middle of in the middle of the middle of jupiter like it's there's this subsection that's a hymn do do boo boo do 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 and it's really slow and it builds up from one line layer and layer and as it's building i'm actually feeling the vibration of the low brass and the vibration of and so it's it's you know as a listener you hear the vibration if you had speakers you would see the speakers moving but as a player i'm feeling it in my chest because when things are perfectly in tune i mean like if 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 the low brass is playing an a exact and my violin is tuned perfectly my a will vibrate without me doing anything like the string vibrates you can see it happen so this you know when everything is perfectly in tune and the instruments are perfectly together there's an extra vibration you're actually a part of and that just makes the the emotion that much stronger um it's totally incredible you know i can i cannot even i would say imagine how much coordinated practice it would require for let's say a orchestra of 20 30 50 people to be in sync so it's really funny like the regional orchestras that i play in um we're very skilled players and we're not playing every single day as our job um so so we have to really go home we have to take the conductor's um thoughts we have to know our conductor well and know what they'll be looking for i know of my conductors i know that i have one conductor that likes every single thing to be very very short in the bow I have another conductor who likes everything to have a ton of emotion and vibrato um so so 
knowing the conductor and what they tend to like is helpful in preparation before the rehearsal. Um, and then for the larger orchestras, you know, for all, for the, the for the top orchestras, they are really hiring and looking for musicians that can do this and figure this out, and also for a very specific sound. Um, you can tell when you're listening to uh, Berlin versus Cleveland versus New York versus Philadelphia because the conductor is so strong in their vision and the musicians that they choose in the audition are musicians that fit not just the technical skill but the vision and the sound what kind of a sound do they want to create so this is something that um that it goes beyond the coordination of of the rehearsals the big orchestras they hire the very very best players technically they could get whoever they wanted and they hire those players who already have that the sound that they want like the, the sound quality so you know of course when you can do that it's much easier to then to then um then you're focusing on the finer points you're not focusing on coordination or technique you're you're focusing on it's already taken care of yeah yeah, exactly. Um, so the big orchestras have an advantage for sure. Um, and I love, you know, my, like playing in the regional orchestras, we are still, you know, we're working toward those goals always and coming prepared. You know, we, we come as prepared as we can. Um, you know, I spend a couple hours a day practicing still. Um, you know, when I'm not playing, I'll, I still spend time uh, practicing and working out the orchestral music so that I go ready to make changes, to blend, to take the conductor's vision and try to bring that to life. Fascinating. It's a whole world. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really fast. Like I have only watched, but just watching does not tell you the the details of it. This is this is this is yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is the first time I would say I'm listening to all of this. I don't think I'm gonna sleep tonight. <laughs> there's a great podcast i can recommend so i study uh, last for the past year and again this year i've studied uh, with nathan cole who's one of the concert masters of the la philharmonic and he and his wife akiko um have a podcast called stand partners for life and they're both violinists they've both played with lots of orchestras so if you're Anybody who's really interested in hearing like the details of of any kind of like orchestral playing, I I highly recommend it. I listened to it just for the first time in the past year, and um, so interesting. If if you like, the, if you want to know like the the dirt on orchestras and what it's like, it's it's highly fascinating. Um, yeah, it, yeah, it is <laughs> some kind of secrets of the harmony. I I would say you know. It's so wonderful that you know this is a part of your life. It's so it's so cool, man. You know, it, it it informs so much of how I think about things, and I think it's been um, it's been a real constant in in my life and in my personality and just what I care about. And having almost you know having I almost lost it um, back in twenty twenty. So really realizing. Um, how much I cared about it just reinvigorated my my passion toward it. This is this is just one part of your life, which is already very fascinating. Could you could you share? So you, you do all of this. You graduate from college. You want to do orchestra again for the love of it. So how did you? I don't know. Think about it. Figure out or got interested in engineering. Yeah. Um, so this as is, a little, this is like north and south, in my yeah. world. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's that way in a lot of people's worlds, right? Like yes. people think, oh, like the artist, the right brain, and then the engineer, the left brain, right? And and what? And for me, it was not. It, it actually made like a lot more sense to me. People have always asked me that question, um, but really, when I was a little girl. Um, my dad got our first computer. I mean, we didn't like he put it on a credit card. We didn't have money for like groceries or whatever. And he comes home with a computer, and my mom was just livid. She was so mad. I mean, like 
if you imagine like a comedy show where the dad comes home and the mom's like, nah, 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 like this is the situation. And, you know, but we, he sets up the computer and then um, he gets a book on a PC logo, which is just using like programming the turtle. And I was programming. I spent hours like just making screensavers and figuring out how to use the turtle and write these programs. And they were like hundreds of lines. And my dad was, he would let me like stay up late when my mom was working. He like, he'd be like, everybody go to bed. And I'd be like, but dad, and we're, he's like, okay. And then he'd actually like watch the door. And when my mom got home, he'd be like, she's here, save, run. <laughs> so, so like when I was really little, when I was like 10, 11 years old, this is what I'm doing. Um, and then, you know, in high school, I actually was not a very good math student. I struggled to understand math. And my math teacher said, he actually told me that I was stupid. And I really believed it for a long time. So I kind of didn't do computers for, for a while. But then fast forward, um, it's 2007. My dad has discovered Linux and is, um, is you know, so excited about it. And I have to teach a music production class. Um, I don't have computers to teach it on. So I'm teaching in a New York City school. They're like, you're teaching music production. I'm like, okay, you have 25 kids. Cool. You have 10 laptops. Huh? And we're not buying you software. What? Um, so, you know, so I have to do this job and I don't have the materials to do the job. And at the very same time, my dad has been telling me on the side about open source and Linux and all these things. So I ended up spending the summer because I wasn't, this was all kind of new to me at that point. Um, I ended up spending the summer making a USB stick with all the software that the kids could run on any computer in the school. So as long as they recorded and did things that they needed to in the recording lab, I could send them to the library with a USB stick, right? So I kind of got back into it because I had to. Um, and because I wanted to do things like have a website for the class, which in 2007, in public schools, nobody was doing that. I mean, now we can't even imagine without it, but that was so new to be able to have material, you know, the kids, oh, I missed class. Okay. You know, the lecture from yesterday, just go on your phone and find it. They're, what? I'm like, yeah. You know, so I got really into it as a part of teaching and then I needed to do dissertation research and, you know, in 2012 and needed not to be teaching because I was actually working on my doctoral degree. Um, but I still needed money to eat and pay rent. And so my, um, my boyfriend at the time said, Oh, have you ever, you know, have you thought about testing software testing? And I was just like, dude, what's that? And he's like, you know, you break software. And I was like, because he was a developer. And so, you know, he's like, yeah, you just break software. I'm like, wait, they pay you for this? <laughs> because that's me. I'm the person who always makes, who always finds the weird thing. Um, he's like, yeah, and you'll be perfect. Like, you're so anal retentive. And I was just, you know, like, like that's an insult, but also you're not wrong. Right. <laughs> so, and he was, I mean, he was right. My first day, uh, first four hours, I'd never done it. I had no instructions. They're just like, here's a wireframe, write down the problems in the spreadsheet. I was like, okay. And I found 76 bugs in four hours. And it was just, um, I was hooked on the exploring things and how things worked. Um, and to me, it felt the, the connection was almost immediate. Um, when you go in a practice room with the violin and a Mozart concerto, you have a thing that somebody has written. And you spend hours looking at every measure, trying to work out how to play it, how to phrase it. In software testing, you have a software product that somebody has built and you lock yourself in a quiet place and you have a test plan and you spend, or, or, or a hypothesis and you spend hours trying to figure out, okay, what would it look like if, what would this look like if, what, is, what are the risks? Um, you know, so you start to ask these questions. So to me, it actually felt very, very natural That's right. yeah. to do this. And then teaching myself Python and Ruby so I could do test automation also felt natural because music is a symbol system of language. 
computer programming is a symbol system and a language. So if you are abstract enough, the relationships are really, really close. Um, and it never occurred to me that it was actually far away until people kept asking me. <laughs> you, you, got, you got started in software testing. So what, what happened in the middle? How, how did you, you know, end up in hardship part? In the end, and the end, the end of it. You, you know, I, I was in testing for a long time. I spent maybe I spent the first four years being either the lead tester or the only tester, and writing automation at, at smaller and mid-sized companies. Um, so I worked at Rent the Runway for a little while. I worked at Bitly, um, doing doing front-end test automation with Python and Selenium or Ruby and, and Selenium, um, Capybara, those kind of technologies, um, and then I moved over to Salesforce and I had the opportunity there to go from being an individual contributor to a director role and building a team. So, um, you know, management and teaching are just quite similar in my mind because the role of a manager isn't um, do the thing. It's helping somebody grow to the best of their ability. And so I really loved. Yeah. And so I really loved having and growing a team and helping every team member become the best at what it was that they wanted to do with their career. So to me, teaching and management were the perfect like alignment. And um, and I spent I spent roughly four years at Salesforce um, and and over two as a director. And I had I had a large team. Um, well, large for me, it was the biggest team I've had. I had 30 people on my team. Um, and you know, then they had a reorg and our, you know, we, you know, we had a lot of things shift around during the pandemic, which I think a lot of people experienced. Um, and at that point, you know, I thought to myself, um, the problems that I like to solve, the, the things I like to think about are much more strategic. I really loved, um, management. I loved understanding the business aspect of of a product, um, I felt that understanding the business needs and the product needs really informed how I thought about risk, quality, releasing a product. And I also noticed, you know, I mean, the, the past two and a half years in the job in the landscape has been all over the map, right? Yeah. And yeah. unfortunately, and you know, I noticed, happening. oh yeah, it's, yeah. it's unpredictable at best. And what I noticed was that there were not as many quality roles, but there were a lot of engineering management roles available. And I thought to myself, well, engineering management with a quality mindset is actually a really good idea. So I have the skills I need to, to be an engineering manager. Like if I can do a director of quality, I can also be an engineering manager. There are things I need to learn that I, you know, that I don't yet know. Um, but one of my goals was to, to learn, you know, start learning those things. So, um, I did a business degree. I started, uh, an EMBA and actually ended up finishing that last May. Um, I got an engineering manager role at, um, at Influx Data and was there working on one of their open source products. Um, so that was really great. And then, um, and then, yeah, I, um, saw this, you know, last, year I saw this role at HashiCorp and I, I mean, I loved, I've loved Hashi too. I've known about them, um, and was working with them at my last company, um, working with the Terraform, uh, deploying with Terraform. I was just like, this is amazing. Like, imagine what you could do, is, you know, is, so, yeah. um, you know, smart solutions to hard problems. And so it made me want to work there. And then, um, you know, a lot of companies talk about having, um, a humble attitude and a learning attitude, but then you get into the company and it's not really that way. Um, and what I will say is that um, Hashi actually means it when they say it. Like, he, like our humility is probably our core value. Yeah. He, like, humility and integrity, the things that matter most to me as a human being, um, the things that make it easy for me to be a good manager and to help people grow. So, um, so I was so excited to, to start there and, and now I'm working on, uh, the console core, uh, product, 
which is, uh, it's, it is complex. It is the hardest technical learning I've had to do in my career. Um, and I get to build out a lot of the internal engineering training because of my background in education. Um, this is something that I get to do, which is just, um, I'm, I can't tell you how much I'm enjoying the learning, um, enjoying having these brilliant teammates. I mean, the team that I manage is just filled with brilliant people who are happy to explain things to me in very simple ways and then help me turn that into a learning module. So as we bring new people in, they can then experience and learn um, in, in a way that helps them be successful and helps us all be more successful. So it's really, um, I, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's such a great, it's such a great job. I'm, I wake up happy to go to work every single day. Um, it's just awesome. You know, you know what I'm noticing? You take on a project where it, uh, let it may be an education project or the orchestra project or the testing project. And it seems to me for, as an outsider, right, that everything you kind of learned in the last one, last project kind of uh, helps you in the next one. So maybe you are lucky that way, that you are presented with the opportunity and you're also smart that you're able to explain the, the skills you have to the next, the next person who is, who is trying to work with you. And if you like the skills, you somehow figure out how to get those skills as well. Like it, when you mentioned that in the council team, you are actually building the education material, which again comes, comes down to the education career you have had for so long. And when you, when you mentioned that, you know, uh, programming is very similar because even music notation is a coding system. If you think about it that way. Yeah. So I, I, I see that, you know, you're making all these, uh, connections or like dr drawing com commonalities in all these different things that you're doing. Do, do you feel it, it kind of comes natural to you or do you actually sit down and think about these things? What do you think? I, I think that it's kind of how my brain works. Like it does come naturally in that the thought just like pops in. Like, oh, huh, that's interesting. That's just like this. And then I'm like, really though? And so the thoughts pop in, but then I do spend time to think about what is that? Like, where did that thought come from? <laughs> and what does it mean? And then asking questions. So like the first time I really was talking, I was talking with um, a coworker named August back at Rent the Runway. He was a product manager there. And he, we were talking and he was the first person who told me about um, um, generative grammar and Noam Chomsky, which is like actually a huge foundation for, for comp sci. And I was blown away because what I was talking to him about was, um, was linguistics and as they applied to educational assessment, because I was finishing my doctorate at that time. And so it just blew my mind. You know, and so it's like part of part of it is having the question and the thought. And then I've always taken those questions from the time I was 19 or 20 and, and written them down and then gone to, you know, I've, I mean, we've had Google since I was that age. Thank God. Right. Like, so, thank, thank God I've had like the, the, the Internet um, because all of this is so much easier to go to research, to look for articles or blogs or videos um and then just say hmm i'm not the there's there's no way i can be the only person who's had this thought um but maybe i'm new to this thought in this way but let me start pulling pieces let me see what other people have thought um so the the question itself just pops in and visits but writing it down and investigating it and then if it turns out to be useful or helpful um writing about it sharing it uh doing something with the information i think is the the work part of it um because i don't have an i'm i am not google i am not chat gpt i only know what i know and so a thought pops in i have to find that backing information to to see if it's see what it means and if it is useful or if it's just kind of like a weird idea that doesn't have any traction. What, what, what do you think it is? I mean, it is one thing to, let's say, you know, be curious and get the skills. 
it is another skill to understand these connections it is a third thing to actually get the opportunity to actually you know implement those insights that you're getting so how do you see your journey so far i think that part of it is people there's a saying and i I don't know who's responsible for it it isn't me but um luck is when preparation meets opportunity right and so i i do have an attitude in my life where the things that i focus on um are you know are things that i'm deeply interested in doing and that's the first thing i i i'm I'm deeply passionate and I know what I'm passionate about. And so I put my energy where my passion is. That's, I think, the first thing that makes the journey easy, even when it's hard. Um, Because it's like, okay, I can keep going because I'm passionate, even though I'm frustrated. (laughs) I think the second thing is um, thinking about the, your, like, my own experience in the context of the world that I want to be a part of. Um, I want to be a part of a world where we are good human beings to each other. I want to be a part of a world where I'm helping other people to live happy, fulfilling lives, whatever that looks like. Um, And in my sphere of influence, it's mostly work and orchestra and, and the, you know, the people I care about, my, my family. Um, So in the ways that I can, that I can use my skills to impact the world around me and make it reflect more of what I want it to look like. That's helpful. And then, you know, something that I am, that I do and people, I I think it depends on the context of a person's personality, of a person's um, workplaces, culture, opportunities, right? There's a lot of factors. Um, And in the ways that I can, I look for opportunity. So there was no at work, you know, at, at Hashi, people are like, you know, we want to strengthen onboarding for engineers. Um, and it wasn't, I wasn't um, like hired to do that in, in the console team. I just, I was like, oh, well, you know, we could do this and this and this because we have these systems and we can put it together this way. Like, oh, I have an idea. Let me present the idea because I have these skills, because I have this knowledge and because I think I can put it together. So I think that that's um, a pretty, I think that's something that I don't know that um, my, the things that I do are unique to me. I think maybe the way that I approach them is kind of like, it's natural to me. So it's like, okay, but I do think that people can reflect on who they are and what they want to see in the world around them and how they're able to help to use whatever skills they have to help make that in, in a way. Um, and then looking for the places where their skills and their passion could be useful. Even if somebody isn't saying to them, Oh, Hey, you, um, sometimes looking and saying, Oh, that's me. I get, this is me. I can do that. I can go and make this amazing right so noticing when your skills are the right fit or when you think they are and having like the kind of courage to stick your neck out and then maybe be told no or and or and maybe even be told no a few times in a few different ways yeah (laughs) it's very fascinating if you ask me you know i deeply love what i do i i i find a deep deep amount of joy it's it's very it's very visible you know (laughs) Yeah, and you, you, so you know you mentioned Terraform, right? Like you used to work with a, with a bunch of guys who were using Terraform, trying to coordinate and all. Yeah, I, I would say that's also how I got introduced to Hashicorp to begin with. Did not know the name Hashicorp for a very long time. Right. And a bunch of my uh, friends are like hardcore cloud engineers since the last six, seven years, and they keep on talking about their projects that the, the client is trying to upgrade the infrastructure, migrate the infrastructure and trying to, uh, as they call it, redo the whole thing on Terraform again. Like they built it, but but they want to, you know, keep up with the industry. And turns out Terraform is the industry. Then that's the default setting. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, in that way, HashiCorp has really been able to define or maybe lead where, things are going in the cloud native space 
so could, could you could you share first of all uh, how did you make sense of it and like where hashikov is taking the world in some some sense and where is hashikov taking the world from what you can share maybe yeah um i mean i could really i can talk about sort of my my experiences and since i'm on the console team um we we interact with the terraform team but we um you know but it's definitely a separate it's really a separate product system um in terms of in terms of terraform though i mean what and in terms of all of hashi's products i think that the the focus that you can see that anybody can see is that we are about um a open source like really having access like if you want to learn it you can go learn it if you want to try it out you can get the binary and try it out um it's, so it's, it's like everything's open which is um which i think provides so many opportunities for learning um i've i've worked on products for the past six or seven years um everything i've worked on almost has been open source um because i you know i just really um you know i understand that as a business model there needs to be closed aspects there needs to be ways to sell and uh, and you know have enterprise grade products and those require a lot more support and and work right so in in different ways so i understand that but for to start with open source is just really um exciting and then you know i think the other thing that that i i really am fascinated by and it's also a huge technical challenge is that hashi is focused on um how do we open up to people wherever they are whether you want to deploy do you want to deploy multi cloud do you want to do multi cloud and your bare metal server and hashi corp hashi cloud like however you want to do it hashi wants to be there to 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 do it with you right like um and and i think that i think that the thing that's super smart about terraform when like when i first started using terraform um I was blown away by the fact that you could just connect. There are so many connectors. There's so many ways. Yeah, like, you can, yeah, yeah. And it's all in code, right? Yeah, so it all, meets yeah. engineers where we are, which is, hey, we're in GitHub, right? Or we're in, we're in some kind of uh, version management system and we're in circle. So, so instead of having our, all of our operate or all our DevOps and, and setup be, in some different place that somebody has to memorize or run this shell script and hope that you remember to install all the right components or, Oh, we upgraded this version of that. And now if you, if you didn't get the memo, yeah, like your stops compiling and Terraform kind of just solves all that because it is infrastructure as code. So the infrastructure becomes a part of it operates like everything else instead of being its own kind of separate entity. And I think that to me, that was, so it's so smart i mean it's like mind-bogglingly smart it's like genius right <laughs> yeah like state management they, they maintain it at any cost no matter what you do yeah magic is the word for it. it it feels like magic and it's actually technically you know when i look at console which is you know which is the the um i manage one of the console teams and i manage the core team and you know we're really responsible for um the functionality of the core binary you know, this idea that you can build service discovery or a service mesh that will be reliable and that could, you know, if you deployed in Google Cloud and Azure and and Amazon and your Amazon instance goes down and you want to put up a backup, you know, in a different region or in a different cloud and you just can. I mean, it's the technical, it, it is a challenging engineering problem, right? It, it is. And it's one of the most complicated products I've worked on, but what it offers people, what it offers users is this ability to really have um, reliability of their services and scalability of their services across this, you know, this uh, really the service mesh idea. Um, so, so again, um, you know, learning about the internals of this is just mind blowing. Like the things that have been implemented to make this possible. Um, it is it is a massive learning journey for me coming from um, writing Selenium tests and then doing some unit testing to okay um, service mesh welcome like it's, it's a whole but but what 
but the problems we're solving are really um, truly fascinating and I think are going to, I think it is leading because it is applicable. You know, we really aim to be agnostic. Yeah. All of Hashi's products aim to be agnostic, meet you where you are. And so I, I just, um, I think that's the key strength that, 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 that Hashi has as a company. So you, you, you take, to take all these learnings and, and you're trying to kind of put it in the teaching community business you're trying to build. In a different way, yes. In a different way, okay. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, for me, part of being in a, in any situation is like, okay, what can I learn from this in, in general? Um, and, and, and what I'm learning as a part of, you know, having been in small startups, having seen how software is built, um, having seen what, what is, what does product market fit mean? Right. So this is the, the struggle I have right now is that education is, you know, it's, it's in the United States at least. And I believe to a lesser extent in the UK and, but I think around the world in general, because of the pandemic, education has experienced a massive shakeup. We know students have learning loss um, and nobody's really sure what to do about it. Millions of kids, actually, yeah. They lost a year or two. Yeah. Right. And parents, you know, they've done the best they can because they're trying to take care of their kids and their families and maybe their, their parent, you know, their parents or other, um, you know, they've experienced illness. And then you're looking at education systems where basically kids are just go are going back into school and now teachers are trying to make up for years of learning loss, years of social loss, right? Because kids don't really socialize on Zoom meetings the way that they would in a classroom. And so there's all this social loss. So there's there's all these difficulties that, that occur to me and it makes it hard to, um, it makes it hard to start a business and and sell a product around this. So actually I'm, really moving um you know i always had an open community model as the model and now i'm actually i was trying to be like very global about it but i'm actually pulling back and i'm going to work with my with the local schools where i can go in talk with them and um really see uh meet teachers where they are and meet administrators where they are and really um get beta work done but all of this i wouldn't know how to do if i hadn't worked in tech businesses yeah 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 like and and i mean i build my wordpress site myself you know i do all that stuff so that's just some tech skills put in um to you, you know <laughs> but uh but yeah all that stuff doesn't happen it, i wouldn't be able to imagine how to do all these things without all the experiences that that i've had you know before i came in before i decided to you know uh let's say, have a coffee and sit down. I was thinking that you are going to share some insight, which is going to be so simple because you figure it out. And because I was coming from the world where, you know, oh, violin, oh, engineering, oh, different words, right? But when you shared that, you know, music is basically coding in a different language. And I was like, that's, that, that's what I was looking for, you know? <laughs> yeah it really is right and it's yeah, like totally which, makes sense which you can see and i mean i know tons of musicians like so i used to work with i work with a guy who's now at google who had his doctorate in discrete mathematics and was a harpsichord player i worked with another guy who had his doctorate in music theory and composition who was a lead engineer who was one of the lead engineers that i worked with at the company so yeah, I mean, it's really common, but I think seeing the relationship, sometimes people are like music and math and it's like, no, it's actually not the math part, right? Because I am a terrible math student. I struggled with math. I was a C student at best, but it's it's an abstract symbol system and you use it to make things. That's that's it. Like, it's I'm just like, oh, yeah, that like that makes sense to me. And the way you work with it, you break it apart, right? Like when you're testing code, or you're testing a site, you're not just like, oh no, the whole website. You're like, oh, let me look at this field. And when you're looking at unit tests, you're looking at, okay, what are the individual tests that are happening? What What's the coverage look like? When you're looking at a piece of music, you're like, oh my God, I have to play this whole concerto. You're like, what is this note? Yeah, 
Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, and then you go to the parts that are hard. So, yeah, to me, it's just like, well, this is what I've been doing my whole life, just with a violin in my hand. <laughs> like... do, do, do you feel? So, you know, I have I have done courses, online courses on the subject called the science of learning, like learning how to learn, you know, do, 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 do you feel like you are like the perfect teacher for something like that? No. <laughs> I've given I've given talks about it. Um, it's it's I spent a lot of time studying that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, was just I gave guessing. a talk. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I I have a lot of experience there because of a being a teacher and studying, uh, learning, metacognition, and and these aspects of okay, well, how do you learn? Well, how does anybody learn, right? And and when they studied, um, they actually were studying geniuses back in the 70s. And then they found accidentally when they were studying small children that small children and people who are considered expert geniuses do the same process in learning. Um, and, and so I studied like a lot around that because it's actually the process that when I successfully learn something, it's also the thing that I'm doing. And so you know, I actually find it quite interesting. And it's something that people, if you don't know about it, then, you know, it doesn't occur to you. But once you do know about it, it's so simple and powerful. You're like, oh, oh, you can apply it anywhere. It's a very easy system. It's not like you need to know a lot. You just need to know what metacognition is and then apply it. And it's like this beautiful um, thing. But yeah, I can, I can send a link to that talk if you want. Um, cause I gave it to a software testing conference and I, what I did to show it was I actually gave the audience, somebody in the audience, a chance to pick a part of Mozart's fourth concerto on the violin that I'd never played before. And they picked two lines and I, I learned it in front of them. Wow. I was like, okay, so I don't know this, but this is the process I'm going to use to learn it. And doing it with the violin means that they can hear me learning. Oh, I I want I want to I want to watch it because I I'm trying I think I showed you last time I'm trying to learn this piece on my watch. Yes, yes. It's also comforting to know, like, like because it doesn't sound good, right? It was a hard talk to give because I was like, okay, I sound terrible right now, and I know this, and I'm doing this in public in front of like 200 of you, <laughs> you know. But um, but but I think it's important for people to see that process in action. Like everybody goes through it. We don't wake up knowing things and that's it's so much of engineering too like if all the problems were solvable we wouldn't need engineers and it wouldn't be such a great career path engineers have a skill set but they have to always solve a new unique problem they have to build something new to solve this problem that's what makes it fascinating like you know so it's just like in that learning how do we learn constantly i feel like that's a it's the it's the bias i have in hiring engineers when I hire people for my team, I'm like, do you, do you like to learn? Mm. And what is your frustration tolerance? How much can you tolerate Frust being frustrated and good. get over it? it? Right? Because part Makes of learning sense. is yeah. being frustrated and yeah. then yeah. Yeah. figuring yeah. out how to move through it. And people who don't, they're like, I can't do it. Like that, that fixed mindset, well, I can't do it. I'll never be able to do it versus a growth mindset how am I going to do this? I don't know how, how am, how will I, what help do I need? What course, like, you know, I hire for that because that's more valuable to me. The skills are important. And from a mindset, that mindset will get somebody with less skill further than somebody who's extremely skilled, but also is like, no, I know what to do. And, and I, and I refuse to learn anything else. Or I don't want to talk to people or whatever. It's like, how much are you going to grow, right? Like, so yeah, learning theory informs so much of what I do in terms of team management and hiring. Makes sense. Do you feel like Duolingo has done a fantastic job at like kind of systematizing it for the masses? Like exactly this theory? Um, to teach human language? Or is it, do you think it's something else? I think it's a combination. The, the good news is that we can all find anything we want to find, basically. And if we can't find it, it's easy to make it. That's the world we live in, right? So, you know, um, so that's great. I think that a trouble that I see in education is that 
so many systems of education are so focused on on skill acquisition and memorization like oh can you memorize these multiplication tables these four yeah and it's like that's it's a level of learning there's a thing called bloom's taxonomy and it still applies actually it's from like the 60s but it's basically like there's six levels of learning the lowest is um the lowest level of learning is like rote um memorization so you know your math facts um all that kind of stuff right but then the highest levels of learning are like synthesis and evaluation so taking the facts interacting with the world not only just thinking about and analyzing them but then going the next step and saying okay and what will i do and then evaluation how did that thing that i did work right so this exists but but most school systems focus on memorization through analysis like the lower kind of levels and it's really unfortunate because every all the schools who are doing this testing and i i think that it's more international phenomenon probably um it's not i don't think it's just america um but the problem is that okay so you have all these students who know how to memorize stuff but they don't know what to do with the stuff they've memorized yeah google has also memorized a lot of stuff yeah it can only do that for you so what what are you doing then right i mean so and and i'm not saying knowledge is bad i'm not saying skills are bad i think they're necessary and it's more necessary to figure out okay what can i do how can i combine this information in a new way yeah to make something or to create something yeah and if you look at chat gpt it still can't quite do it like i've i've you know i mean i've it's fascinating in what it can do and i have absolutely stumped it just asking questions that involve two different threads of my own interests because we're not to this place where it can it, where it can take a sum of multiple kinds of knowledge and make something brand brand new right like could it happen probably but this is i i'm fascinated by this and i feel like schools need to teach for the thinking and that's harder it's so much harder it's harder to evaluate it's harder to have numbers to compare one school to another or country to another and i'm like why do we care we need human beings that can think right so this is like deep you know like appearing into my deep mind about how frustrated i am <laughs> since i was in for example college uh, i was always very annoyed by the fact that the human like human knowledge as a whole is kind of divided by this very invisible walls called fields of study so like you know you are in this field you are in that field and it it kind of blinds people that okay if i am an engineer that's who i am and i cannot i cannot be a painter no i cannot think like a painter i cannot think like a violinist does it make sense and we have this invisible walls that are kind of forced upon by the education system mm-hmm. and yeah. they are they are basically legally constructed after some point like yeah and and also there's a psychological wall and a legal wall so there are so many walls and and the point which i have never understood is that i, I did my computer science degree but i was interested in dancing so that's what i did mm-hmm. when i was in college i danced a lot yeah and then i started this awesome. company sunny pajamas which was a design company ui ux branding marketing and now i'm doing podcasting and when i'm talking to you for example i can talk about all those different things without any i don't feel the wall personally speaking but when i talk to people for example they just hit this wall and they they don't realize that they're not able to get out of it and the problem is they never knew that they signed up for the wall it was just kind of forced on yes. them yes yeah 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 that's so astute so that's the context okay that's the context now now let's come to chat gpt now we are taking exactly this contextual knowledge of human knowledge feeding it to an ai system and guess what it's learning the same stupid ideas that we should have solved by now but now it's getting coded in an ai yeah yeah it's it, the walls So yeah so yeah it's it's i mean totally right i mean it's a reflection of ai is a reflection of us machine learning is a reflection i mean who makes it right like even this even any 
in a world 50 years or 100 years in the future where it could develop sentience yeah the root is still all of the systems that we have that inform all of the things that we do right and so the invisible walls i mean yeah that's i feel that deeply because people that you know i have very rare conversations where people spend time talking to me about orchestra and teaching and engineering and like these are not the conversations i have often you know in orchestra world everyone thinks i'm a music teacher even you know they don't they, yeah that's all they think yep yep i get it i i know what they're saying man yeah and in engineering world it's like oh yeah and it's like so aggravating because it's like i'm a human being i have multiple it does not matter what i do you know yeah 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 it's like yeah i totally i get that it's it's frustrating but i kind of am just like okay i don't care like i'm going to do the things i enjoy and live my life the you know and try to do my best to make the world you know the world a place that i want to be in that i want my family to be in and just use my skills that way and yeah you know that's it's, it's all the power i have really i i don't think i have shared this with a lot of people because there was no context there was never the context but the the main reason behind starting this thing we eventually called sunday pajamas is that we have a workshop business and we have a fitness club that we use to organize running camps and cycling camps okay. and we have the podcast and we host cookouts where we you know just cook food and feed people that's awesome and the the way we make money out of it is by consulting startups with their ui ux strategy now i'm learning to become a cloud engineer i got aws certified learning terraform oh nice so hopefully in the next couple of years i'll be a hardcore cloud engineer right i'm learning the violin and hopefully that has something to do with sunday pajamas in the i don't know right i'm i'm i just started a newsletter for example because i enjoy writing right yeah now when you look at sunday pajamas or what i like with the lens of the walls it is very stupid business advice you should not do it <laughs> right but but if you ask me this is so fulfilling i love it i love every day of my life i do what i love doing i go for runs it that's... helps the business i play the violin it helps the business i cook food it helps the business that's And yeah makes sense right it makes perfect sense i mean it's i th- i think it i think it doesn't make sense for everybody it does it does not It But there are certain people sense. for whom it makes a lot of sense, and we are the the type of people who we like having a little bit busy, uh, like lots of different stimulations of different kinds. Um, and for us, it does make sense, and that's I, I think it's important to know it can look different for everybody too. Like a business can look different, which is the thing that I've definitely struggled with because the business advice I'm getting is like, oh, well, you need to do da da da, and I'm like. Yeah, like actually I don't think I'm going to do it that way. I mean, I've spent a year and a half trying to do it the way that business consultants have said, and I'm not you know, I realize that there's just this there's just some different factors that they they aren't seeing and so I'm, you know, I'm pivoting. Um and that's okay too. Right? Like it's it's and if as long as I'm enjoying it and making an impact um eventually, like <laughs> Yeah, that's so fascinating. Like good, I mean, it's, it's I'm very impressed with the AWS certification. That's awesome. I'm uh and, you know, yeah, just ongoing learning is to to me that's the spice of life. We have this whole beautiful world around us. Humans have made art and science and everything. And so being able to to engage with all of the best parts of humanity and that is like and i yeah, i would say that's boy. why i love technology you know if i did yes. not because it kind of enables people like me and you to actually do it and and then to find each other and to find each other exactly like, <laughs> you know like i mean without technology we i wouldn't know you were doing this you wouldn't know i was doing my thing like we wouldn't and now we're connected you know we know each we i know that you have your you know sunday pajamas and you're doing these great business things you know that i'm you know doing the orchestra and we both learned something different today like something we were coming away from this conversation each with 
new things to think about and, and experience. So that's, um, and that's tech. That's why I love it for the same reason. A lot of things we both have been thinking, not exactly in the same words, but like the themes are kind of similar, I would say, like an overarching theme yes. of our life. No? Yes. Yeah. It's so crazy. Man. I have not been it able is. to meet I have not met a single person, like maybe one, I know one friend of mine who is as crazy as we are, but I think yeah. you're just, just the second person that nobody else. Yeah, I, I have a similar, I mean, I know one other person and then it's this, yeah, it's very much, um, it's rare because it's quite intense and a lot of people have difficulty with that. Like a lot of people are like, you're too intense. I can't, I can't with you. Like you're too intense. And I'm like, yeah. Okay, I mean that's fine. It's just it makes me happy, so I'm not gonna not be happy. Makes sense. Yeah, completely. I, I'm just gonna live my life, and that's cool. But yeah, I agree. It's definitely it, it's it's not the usual. I mean, you find people who are very intense, but they're also really miserable. They're like, I have to be intense, and it's like you're a miserable like person to be around. So good for you, I guess. Um, like that's not the kind of you know. I think we're both not talking about that. But just a real natural curiosity about many things, a combination of creative mind and and analytical engineering mind and world curious mind, like all these things are, um, you know, ever growing inside of me. The more I know, the stupider I feel. So uh, <laughs> like the more I encounter, the more I feel like I don't know, um, which is great. What a good problem to have. So when you talk to people, for example, someone new for the first time and you kind of talk about all the different things you are involved in. I mean, I don't recommend doing that very often, but let's say you do that. What do you do? You, do, you, do you do you see them evaluating everything they know about themselves in front of you when you do that? And they're like kind of not okay about the whole situation, like kind of confused and curious and angry, maybe. I think less angry, more confused and curious for sure. Um, and then just picking the things where either they're really like, how did you get here? Or picking a thing that they relate to and then going deeper on that thing. Um, yeah, which is, I mean, that's probably the most common thing. Mostly there's a lot of confusion because there's like, how? And I'm like, what do you mean, how? Like, it's just, um, but you know, how are you doing all this? How are you keeping it all like, whatever, like, so the how thing comes up and then, um, and then the confusion of like, what, how, how does it, how do these things relate to each other? Why would you do one or the other? Like, um, yeah, I think, I think the invisible walls have a pretty big hold. Yeah. It's, and, and, and you know, uh, so I get a similar how a lot of times. And then you explain them because you are a kind person and they understand it during that time. But then I think the walls are so powerful with, I think the next day it's all gone. And then the same question again, but how? And it's like a lot of times, even if you try to explain it, it simply does not make sense. Like you're not able to go through it. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, being understood is tough. It's tough because it's like, I mean, and I think all humans have that experience to a degree. And I think when your mind, I mean, I, I know that my mind works in a way that even I have a hard time understanding. So trying to explain all this, is like, eh, you know, I usually just choose a simple path because it's easier. So what is a simple path? Like not share about it? Uh, yeah. Or like if I'm at an engineering event, I'll talk about engineering. If I'm at a music event, like I'll talk about music. If I'm at a writing, like I have a writing group that I started with my partner. And if we're at writing group, I talk about writing and I might reference something else, which might cause a question or two, but it's just, I, I almost have to simplify because otherwise the complexity is like a lot for, you know, it's just a lot. It's, it's a lot to, um, for some people to like take on. And so I, I simplify by just, okay. Here's the main topic. I might reference these other things if I'm feeling especially adventurous. Otherwise, I'll just live in here and it'll be fine. <laughs> you know, you know, the one experience I am having on the podcast is that no matter the guest, 
no matter who i'm talking to uh we can go on you know the the conversation can go on and like i don't know most of the things people are talking about if there is a doctor who is talking about chronic health and he has spent like 10 years studying chronic health he's, he's a phd on it i might not know the whole thing but I'll, i'll have one story or two references or one book i read or one random podcast listened to 3 years ago and then that's enough to kind of you know take the whole thing forward for 2 3 hours you know right I mean? yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you get more depth, right? Because you have that experience. I mean, in learning theory, this is scaffolding. Like you have a we all have a scaffolding, and if we don't have it, we try to build it. So um and but we take our experiences and then we connect and build on those experiences just like the scaffolding on a building. And so it's a big part of learning theory which many of us even do, we don't realize that we do it, but we do and and when we're unfamiliar with things and curious we will create our own scaffolding we'll go we'll read we'll research a little bit we'll say oh i had this experience and that experience that's like this and you've had this tell me more help me make my scaffolding stronger like how was how was the whole experience of that it felt great because you're asking things um you have good questions let's put it that way like you have good deep questions that are interesting um and things that i rarely get to talk about um which So I like that I get to talk about them um because it's just never something that uh most people don't care they're just like oh that's really interesting that you played in an orchestra next um but there's actually a lot about it that's fascinating and you really dug into it so I'm pretty uh yeah I feel I feel good I had a lot of fun 